<sighs> Hello everybody, Terrence Pop here with another episode from the lair! <laughs> We're now at uh, the stories of life in the battalion and uh, you know, it is what it is. Now, for some of these, for some of you guys out there, you younger guys, this was in the like early 90s, late 80s, so this is a completely different world than it is today. We're talking 30 plus years ago. Uh, this particular story, I had two of them actually. One when I was a, a staff duty runner and one when I was on CQ. Now, this Bravo company, and I think the other um, companies had the same rally point, but back then they used to have this uh, car wash and then its sign was this big fucking pink elephant. And there was one in Tacoma and there was one in Seattle. And those were basically hostile rally points. So if you were so fucked up, if you were drunk, whatever, and you needed a hot extraction, you call the CQ and you say, hey, I'm fucked up, I need to get picked up. And we'd say, where are you at? And we'd have the map out and we'd look for them like, okay, I see where you're at. You need to go a half a mile north. Uh, turn right on Manchester, uh, you'll go down three quarters of a mile, and on that main MSR right there, you see the pink elephant. You just need to make it to the pink elephant. I'm going to get in the GSA van, we're going to come up there and get you. Can you do that, Ranger? A lot of times I get the, I, I can make it, or I have like five or six dudes from different companies like, well, we'll be all right, yeah, just come get us. So, you know, I'd have to sign out of the barracks, go fucking get the GSA keys, walk out there, start the van, and go on my fucking merry way to pick up a bunch of fucking wayward rangers from, you know, fucking their lives up or doing stupid shit. Uh, so I did that once up in Tacoma, and I get up there, and, uh, you know, I roll up on the scene, and there's, you know, six rangers... And they're like in an active fucking fist fight with, I don't know what the hell was going on. There was maybe 15, 16 guys. So, I mean, it's the point where I get out of the van, I'm in starch and spits, and I'm throwing fucking knuckles, kicking dudes in the face, fucking beating the shit. I don't know who these people are. I just walk on the scene. I don't even know the story. All I know is I got, I got some airborne rangers here that need a hostile pickup. And I'm going to give it to him. <laughs> so we beat this dude's off. He scuttled back to the van and we fucking get out of there. You know, I get back to the barracks. And I pull into the Bravo Company parking lot, park it. And, uh, you know, there's like two guys from Alpha Company, you know, three guys from Charlie Company, and two or three guys from Bravo. You know, and I don't ask any questions because that was the, the, the unwritten rule. You call for extraction. You're not in fucking trouble with the cops, and you're not in trouble with me. You know, and the first sergeant would be like, so you, you signed out the van, what you go do? Ah, I just want to pick up a couple drunk rangers. Ah, it's good shit, man. It's good shit. Nobody got in trouble? Everything's good? Yeah, okay. And that was it. It was, it was a done deal. And I remember I had to do the same thing when I was staff duty, but I had to go all the way to fucking Seattle, and I had to pick up like 19 fucking people. And the van only holds like 13 guys. So... You know, I go up, I drive there. It's like 40 minutes, 37 minutes to Seattle, you know. I roll in there, the fucking pink elephant, and they're all fucking, I jam them all in there, you know. And before I get on Fort Lewis, you know, because I tried to, you know, get as close as I could, which is basically the Madigan Gate. And from there, it's like 4.7 miles to the barracks. Um, there's another story that goes along with this. But, you know, since you could only, you know, have, I think it was 12 people in that van, you know, there wasn't enough seat belts, the other rangers had to walk, or I had to come back and get them. So a lot of times the lowest ranking dudes, like, hey, fuck you, get out of the van, start walking back, and I'd drive the other guys back, drop them off, and I'd drive back and get the other rangers about, you know, a mile, a mile and a half away from the gate, load them up and bring them back too. Yeah. <laughs> That was, those were some good conversations, you know. And all you had to say was like, can you make it to the pink elephant? If you can make it, you're golden. If you're not, I don't, I don't fucking, I can't guarantee I'll be able to find you. Because, you know, it's a big fucking world out there. And everyone knew, because we had strip maps to the pink elephants. A lot of times guys would go to Seattle, we'd hand them a strip map. Be like, okay, this is uh, the fish market here. And you, you circle all the good areas. I'm like, this is the pink elephant. If all, everything else fails and you don't have transportation and the world is coming to an end, 
Call us on the payphone, make it to the pink elephant, and we'll fucking come and get you. And, you know, it is what it is. I, myself, was never picked up at the pink elephant, but a lot of other rangers were, so it was actually fairly common. Okay. Now, in the other story I did before this, I mentioned how the MPs used to be cool. Back in the day, if you drive on to Fort Lewis and they smelled alcohol on you, they would immediately make you pull your fucking car over. And if you were an airborne ranger, they would jerk your ass out of the car, take you to the fucking shack, you know, uh, and call the fucking CQ or staff duty runner. Uh, many times, I would drive to either the Madigan Gate or the, the gate off, uh, you know, by the impact area, and that was a fucking bitch. Uh, that didn't happen that often, but uh, usually it was the, the Madigan Gate, because that was the closest one. And I would drive out there in the van, and uh, there would be one or two guys there, and they're all liquored up. And they start getting in the van. And they're like, no, 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 Rangers. What, what, what the fuck do you think you're doing? I, you're drunk. You're not getting in my van. I'm not having any DWI fucking passengers. I'm going to turn on the hazards, and you're going to run behind the van... 4.7 miles back to the battalion, you drunk motherfuckers. <laughs> and that's what I would do. I'd turn on the hazard lights, you know, driving about, you know, maybe 8 to 12 miles an hour, and they're fucking running behind the fucking the van. I don't have to worry about them falling out or anything because they're fucking young and instructable. Plus, they're in the best shape of their fucking lives. <laughs> and the next day, they would give me shit. Oh, that's fucked up. It made us fucking run back to the barracks, Pop. That's fucked I'm like, hey, man. It's either run back to the barracks or get a DWI and get fucked up. Okay, now, you know, back then, the DWI thing wasn't nearly as bad as it is today. It wasn't like a career ender. You know, you'd have to go to adapt a class and shit like that. Now, if you did it two or three times, you know, they'd probably, you know, take more drastic action. But it was, you know, a one-time thing, it, it was survivable. And it, it, it didn't really, you know, it wasn't as, as drastic as it is today. I also mentioned about the story about the one, uh, the, the, the domestic, you know, fucking issue that was going on on, on post housing. You know, on at least three or four different occasions for different rangers, you know, we'd get a call from the MPs, okay? Uh, they'd be, you know, in their vehicle, like down the block from a domestic that was called in. They would identify who it was, because back in the day, I don't know how it is now, but on post housing, they have your, your name, they have the, the unit you're in, and the rank that you, you have, and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, a couple times, I'd get the call, I'd be on the CQ, but hey, you know, we got some NPs. Uh, they're gonna go check out this domestic, you know, you know, situation in about 20 minutes. If you get there in 10 or 15 minutes and you defuse the whole thing, we're not even gonna make the call. We're just gonna say it's fucking resolved. So I jump in the fucking GSA van, roll my ass out there on on post housing. Usually I'd walk in there and, and fucking settle fucking shit down, and I make them. I'd be like, hey motherfucker, you know. I'm the CQ for Bravo Company. The MPs fucking called me because they're fucking down the fucking block. I'm taking you into the fucking barracks. You can spend the night there and cool the fuck off. Usually, usually, they fucking like, all right, yeah, I understand. It's cool. And they would get in the van. Maybe they'd take a pillow. I don't fucking know. And they'd go to the fucking barracks. You know, and nothing more was said about it. All right. It wasn't a big fucking deal. But this one time, this one guy was a hothead. He was a drinker, which the two are very fucking poor combination. And, uh, you know, he was a guy that lifted a lot of weight. So he was like, I would say he was like brute strength wise. He was stronger than me. I, my, my, my claim to fame was explosive strength. Cause when I trained, I trained for striking and I worked on explosive strength. He was just a fucking, he was just a, a lumox. You know, he wasn't a fast runner, but he could carry like half his body weight forever. He, he was just an animal. So, you know, I get the call. I go up, to, you know, upstairs to, you know, one of my other ranger buddies. I'm not going to say his name. Short, he was a little shorter, you know, wide, built like a Hulk, you know. And I'm like, hey, man, we got to roll on this guy's fucking house. You know how he is. He's drinking. He's fighting with his wife. Uh, he's probably not going to want to come back, you know, of his own volition. 
<laughs> so we roll out there and like literally we roll up just as the MPs are getting out of the car. And they see and I, they see the GSA van and I'm like, yeah, second bat. Yeah, I'm, we're gonna take care of it. You just don't worry about it. We walk in there and they're, she's throwing plates and he's fucking swearing and he's throwing pills at her. And there's, I mean, it's under fucking pandemonium. Now his wife was a Latino. So, you know, anytime there's a fight with a Latino and it and normally it would be a six, six fight. You know, you add three to that and it becomes a nine. You know, 10 is where they use weapons, but this is this is like a nine. You know, check out my video, the ethnic anger scale, or it proves my fucking point. So we walk in there and he's like, fuck you, get out. I'm fucking handle my own business. And I'm like, dude, the MPs are gonna come. This is gonna be fucking ugly. No, he's fucking being stupid, you know, and sure as shit, you know, I gotta fucking punch the guy. You know, I fucking punch him. He fucking does one of these and fucking you know, clocks me good one right between the eyes. Boom, I go sit down. My buddy jumps on him, wraps him up real good. And he's about to throw him off. And I jump in there and I remember I tilt his head to the side and go bam, right at the base of the neck. Just a nice chop. Doesn't hit the, doesn't hit the fucking bone. So there's no, no, no worry of a jaw disconnect. And it's below the ear. There's a bunch of nerves right here. You fucking hit that shit and it, it, it fucks with a lot of shit. Boom, boom, stun him up. We fucking, you know, we didn't have flexi cuffs back then, so we had those fucking Ranger 550 cuffs, fucking whoosh, zip them up, fucking under each arm, we fucking roll them up before he fucking, you know, before he, you know, gets to his senses and goes fucking batshit crazy. Because I'd rather have him in the van going batshit crazy on the way back to the battalion than have him go batshit crazy in front of the MPs and then, you know, since they're seeing crazy shit going on, that they probably have to get involved. So we quickly walk right by the MPs. Oh, nothing to see here. Everything's good. Oh, throw him in the van. <laughs> My buddy sits on him, and we drive back, and he's fucking, fuckers, I'm going to kill you both. You fucking sons of bitches. We're like, all right, Sergeant. You're going to kill us. I got it. You fucking punched it in. Seal. Yes, I did. Whatever. We can tell the first Sergeant tomorrow when you fucking sober up. It's all good. Because I remember the van had that fucking shifter on the fucking column thing. It fucking sucked. <laughs> And sure as shit, you know, after PT and he's he's sobered up and the doc gave him an, M an IV, you know, he walks up and he's like, uh, sorry about last night and I'm not going to kill you. And, uh, you know, thank you for doing what you did because uh, that fight wasn't going to go anywhere good and I would be in serious trouble. And I'm like, sorry, it's all good, man. Don't worry about it. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> But if I if I'd have missed that fucking shot and I didn't stun that guy, he would have kicked my ass. He would have kicked my ass and my buddy's ass at the same time, and we're both fucking in rocket shape, because this guy had like 30 pounds on me, so he was like a good 220-ish, and me and my buddy, you know, he was like 190, 185, and I was like 176, 175. Yeah, no, no, maybe we could have, you know, wrestled on the ground, but I don't, I don't think we could have subdued him, you know. It's just not, it just wasn't going to happen. It was just a luck thing, you know. And then uh, there was another NCO, and, and this this particular one was very similar, except I was the runner, okay. And I went with this other NCO to a different guy, a different other NCO's house, uh, and this guy was fucking, just fucking crazy, all right. He was holding guns. He was fucking screaming. It was fucking his kids. There was kids there. It was fucking. It was ugly. And I didn't. I was fucking shit my pants because I'm like, I'm gonna get fucking shot here. This is fucking not. And the my, the guy the guy I was with pulled out his fucking revolver. Boom. Pistol whipped in the head. We zipped him up. Took him the fuck out. Called the, you know when we got back to the barracks we called the doc who comes put four or five stitches in his head. Give an IV. <laughs> And it was all good, you know. And there was no paperwork on anything, and uh, that's kind of how we handled business back in the day. Uh, it wasn't like you know today, where the cops, you know, the, the MPs, or the cops would would write your asses up in a fucking drop of a hat, and uh, you know your chain of command was just waiting to stab you in the back, and then nobody gave a fuck about you. Uh, we were we were brothers, man, and and sometimes you gotta lay hands on a brother when he when he when he's going wayward. You know what I'm saying? And there's no hate in it, you know, we're not trying to maim anybody. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, uh, especially in that line of work, you deal with a lot of crazy shit, 
And a lot of those after effects stick with you for the duration of your life. And uh, now that I'm an old guy and I've experienced the back end of that, uh, I'm going to tell you right now that it's fucking true. So with that being said, gentlemen, till next time. <laughs>